Welcome everyone. I'm Jay Ren. I work in our Santa Monica office. It's my great pleasure here to introduce you with E. Lewis, Prashant Dyer, and Michael Snyder. Where is he? There he is. And finally, Eric Chen. They both are from VMware, and they are here to present a virtual machine-based replay debugging. Eric and I go way back, way, way back. So it's my biggest pleasure to host him here. So enjoy. Thank you. Testing, can you hear me? No. OK, let's get started. My name is E. Lewis. You can call me E. Uh, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me give you a little uh, bit, uh, additional introduction for the guys here. I'm glad that the uh, four of us are outnumbered by the Googlers. That's good. Uh, we've got Michael Snyder. He's a GDB maintainer. We've got Mike Chen. He's the manager. He runs this project. He makes it happen. And we've got Prashant Damdare, yes, how'd I do, uh, who knows way too much about the Windows kernel. So what I'd like to do right now is talk about some work we've been doing at VMware. And uh, I, I, I hope you're going to agree that this, what we've got here represents, I think, a particularly interesting uh, application of machine virtualization. And I, I, I hope to entertain you, but I also hope to inspire you to, uh, we've, we've actually got some products that use this stuff. I, I hope you'll give it a try, play with it a little bit, and tell me the ways in which it sucks so that perhaps uh, we can improve things. So my point is we'd love some feedback here. So uh, let's begin by me trying to guess who you are. I think there, you, you're, you've probably fallen into one of a couple categories. You might be a developer. And you may have said to yourself from time to time, it has to be easier to find bugs. You may be a tester, and you probably have said to yourself from time to time, it has to be easier to report bugs. You may be one of those manager types, and you think to yourself, I need to streamline my test dev processes. And even if you're not one of these, or even if you've never asked these questions, my guess is you're some kind of a technophile, <laughs> and you need a break. So, so here's that break. OK, before we really dive into things, let me give you some uh, insulting, insultingly simple uh, pictures describing what uh, virtualization is, and uh, just, just to make sure we're all sort of on the same page here. So in the traditional view of what a machine is and how programs run, this is pre-Google, pre-VMware. This is what you got, right? You got some hardware on the bottom. You got an operating system that sits on top of that. And then you got op applications that sit on top of the uh, operating system. So in a virtualized world, uh, you've got a picture that looks more like this. And what the, the important distinction here is we've introduced uh, this component. And I'll just call that, in very general, vague terms, I'll just call that the virtualization layer. And what that's doing is that's virtualizing the hardware, the CPU, the memory, the NIC, the disk, et cetera, and then presenting a, uh, a virtual view of that hardware to potentially multiple operating systems sitting on top of it. So I'd like to point out, uh, and I think that the key here, oops, the key here is that that virtualization layer is the boss of whatever is above it. It's in charge. And as a result, it can observe everything that's going on uh, above it. And furthermore, it can control what, it, what, it, what the guy above it does. So it's in, it's in complete control. And that gives you a bunch of nice characteristics, right? That gives you, for example, uh, the ability to migrate virtual machines from one physical machine to another physical machine without actually bringing it down. That's a, a trick we can play because the virtualization layer is in charge. Similarly, what we're going to be talking about here is a, a record replay mechanism that lets us record what's going on inside, on inside a virtual machine and then replay it in exactly the same way. And this is the key to making that happen, because that virtualization layer is in control of everything. We can record what's going on in the virtual machine. We can replay it. Uh, OK. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out just, OK. Good. Another thing I'd like to point out here is that I still have an operating system uh, sitting on top of the hardware. And uh, their, uh, virtualization environments do things in different ways. This is the picture for uh, a product out of VMware called VMware Workstation. And that's what I'm building on here. But of course, there are other virtualization environments, like the ESX server from VMware, where uh, there is no operating system. The, the virtualization layer sits directly on top of the hardware. OK. 
So let's get started. So the, the motivation here is uh, that software, software debugging is important, challenging, and expensive. And I think there's no controversy here. Clearly, it's important. Sometimes developers produce programs that have bugs in them. It happens. Uh, and it turns out they're often really hard to find. If they weren't hard to find, they probably wouldn't have made the mistake in the first place. Uh, and because they're hard to find, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time uh, to find these problems. And what I'd like to do now is highlight what I think are some particularly uh, challenging aspects of software debugging, challenges of debugging. Uh, the first has to do with, well, forget about fixing the bug. Forget about even finding the bug. The first challenge is that the developer, uh, his or herself, did not find the bug. Usually it's somebody else who finds the bug. It's a quality assurance engineer. It's a, a customer out in the field. Uh, so the first step is just communicating the fact that there is a bug to the developer so the developer can fix that bug. Uh, and that's surprisingly difficult. Uh, so you know, the idea is you say, here's the here's a scenario to reproduce this problem. Uh, here are the inputs you need to provide, and so on. Uh, but often, it just kind of doesn't work. Often, the, 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 you say, well, I clicked on a bunch of things in the UI, and then it crashed. Well, that's often not enough to go on. Uh, another challenge is that some bugs just like to hide. Some bugs are non-deterministic. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. As a result, even if you give a perfect description of how you produce the bug, the developer may not be able to reproduce that bug. Another uh, important challenge of debugging, I think, is that debugging is a very invasive process. So sometimes the bug disappears when I look at it in the debugger. And that's because when you attach to a process in the debugger, uh, you're potentially changing the timing characteristics of the application. You're changing how threads are interleaved. You're changing the order in which locks are acquired. Uh, any network connections you have may time out because you're s sitting uh, at some breakpoint trying to decide what to do next. And all three of these sort of boil down to the same thing, which is if you can't see the bug, if you can't reproduce it, if you can't make it happen, it's really hard to fix the problem. Uh, and then a final uh, challenge of debugging, I think, is that debugging is unidirectional. And this, this seems a little weird at first, but it is a little odd. I, or I think uh, those who have uh, debugged have this common problem that uh, you get to a certain point and you say, aha, I know I have a problem. But the manifestation of that problem occurred earlier. You've sort of gone too far. One person shook their head in the audience. This is great. Uh, but, but I think you're all thinking it. You're all thinking shaking your head. Uh, so, uh, let's, so, okay, so these are the, uh, what I think are important challenges. Enter replay debugging. Uh, I think replay debugging is going to help us address these important challenges. So first, what is replay debugging? Well, the idea is dead simple. The idea is we want to record the execution of some program, and then we want to replay that recording, but debug it while it's replaying. Really simple, and we're, we're going to go into this in more detail to make it crystal clear. But uh, I think this is, provides benefits that directly address the four points we looked at on the previous slide. Uh, so first, uh, there's encapsulation. This gives us encapsulation. Uh, I've got everything necessary to reproduce the bug in that recording. right? So there was this problem that delivering uh, uh, telling a developer how to reproduce a bug is really hard, or can be hard. But if you can just give the developer a file, that contains the manifestation of that bug, well, then you don't have to tell the developer anything. It's all encapsulated in that file. Uh, in addition, replay debugging is deterministic. So again, there's this problem that bugs are non can be non-deterministic. They can hide. But once you record a bug, it transforms a non-deterministic bug into a deterministic bug because you can replay that recording over and over again, and the program will have exactly the same behavior. Uh, replay debugging is discrete. This is the opposite of invasive on the, on the previous slide. Uh, because we're creating a recording, and because we're not doing any debugging while that recording is being created, uh, when we replay that recording, the behavior during replay is determined by the behavior uh, while it was recorded. So whatever we do while we're debugging has no impact on the behavior of the program. We're not going to change how, how uh, threads are interleaved, how locks are acquired, or uh, 
We're not going to, our network connections aren't going to time out any of that stuff. And then the final point is replay debugging can give us bidirectionality. Replay debugging can give us abstractions for moving, of course, forward in time, but also backward in time. OK. I think a natural question to ask at this point is, well, how are we uh, implementing this? Uh, how are we recording what's going on inside the virtual machine? Uh, well, so, so first, the, the, the goals of recording inside a virtual machine, the properties we, want, we, we have are that it's whole machine, it's a whole machine recording. So that, so that is to say we're recording what the operating system is doing, we're recording what all the processes are doing, and a principal advantage of that is, well, there's some efficiency issues. Let's not talk about those right now. They're a little subtle. But there are, uh, an advantage to this is if you've got a complex system that has multiple components, you can just record it all and then choose to debug the components that give you a problem at any particular point in time. You don't have to commit to what process you're going to be interested in. Uh, also, uh, our, our, replay, our record replay technology gives us perfect instruction by instruction fidelity. And this is the thing that gives us determinism. The idea is when you record what's going on inside a virtual machine, we're going to replay the identical sequence of instructions, exactly the same interleaving of processes, exactly the same behavior of the operating system and of all of the applications. Instruction by instruction identical. Uh, in addition, uh, our, our technology has low runtime overhead during record and replay and low disk overhead uh, for the recording itself. And I think uh, it's natural to say those second two probably seem like they're at odds with the first two. Like you can't sort of get perfect fidelity and have it be cheap. Uh, so let's uh, uh, look at how we do this before we, and, and then uh, come back to the, this question about the, the overheads that that uh, this record replay technology has. So how do we do it? Well, let me explain it to you in, in 18 inches. It, this topic probably deserves a little more uh, talk than this, but, uh, but here's the summary. It's actually, kind, I think, uh, it's just what you'd expect. The uh, idea is we want to only record non-determinism in the execution inside the virtual machine. And, and th this, this is, I think, th I think this makes sense. As you're executing on a processor, it's usually really easy to predict what happens next, right? It's the next instruction. Or if it's a branch, it's where you branch to. So normally, at any given time, you can easily predict what comes next. And the only place where you can't predict what comes next is when there, uh, somebody enters some in input, there's some sort of an interrupt, uh, a timer goes off, these sorts of things. So what we do is only record the non-deterministic aspects of execution, but otherwise let the processor just do its own thing. Uh, the result then is a small log because we're recording a very small amount of information uh, and very fast execution because we only have to sort of interrupt the processor and sort of uh, interrupt the normal execution of the program when we're dealing with one of those infrequent, uncommon events. So going back then to overhead, uh, in terms of uh, disk overhead, uh, basically, the, the overhead, it, sort of just to give you some ballpark figures about what I really mean by overhead, low overhead here, the disk overhead is kind of in the neighbor, for, for uh, CPU intensive applications, is kind of in the neighborhood of uh, what you see in an MP3. So, say a, a megabyte a minute. That's not so bad, right? Uh, it's also the case, though, that we have to log. Uh, we have to record in this record representation of the recording, we have to record uh, uh, network input, traffic that comes in from the network. And that makes sense, right? Because when we replay, we need to have that network traffic. So what that means then is on top of that, say, megabyte for a minute, we're recording the network traffic coming in. So depending on your application, you're going to have uh, you know, from a little to, to a lot uh, recorded. In terms of the runtime overhead, this again depends on the, the application you're running, but uh, CPU intensive workloads are in the neighborhood of sort of like zero to 5%. Uh, applications that have lots of interrupts are gonna be higher and we've seen as high as say 50%. Again, it just depends on the workload. Yes? Don't you have tools to record uh, this kind of? Uh, so so the, I think the question is, don't you also have to record disk IO? Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah, right. So, so, uh, so I made this comment that I'm recording uh, input from the network. Why well, don't I have to record input from the disk? And the response to that is, well, you can certainly record input to the disk, or uh, you can, in fact, use the disk itself. Uh, you can, uh, so we've got a mechanism that sort of uh, creates a clone of the original disk, does sort of a copy on write kind of thing, and as a result, you've got all your data sitting in the disk, so you can just get it directly from the disk rather than having to record it. So that's just sort of a, a little optimization that avoids needing to do that recording. Which reminds me, if you uh, have any thoughts and you'd like to ask questions as we're going, please do. Yeah. How about memory? If you had a bug that was reading from uninitialized memory, how do you handle that? So, so the question was, if we, uh, if there's a, uh, if you're dealing with a bug that uh, results from uninitialized memory, will it still be deterministic? And the answer is yes. Yeah, because we, uh, this recording. Uh, starts from exactly the same machine state, all of RAM is the same, and then we're doing a deterministic sequence of instructions that are just going to do exactly the same thing. Yes? Right, right. So the, I, I think the question is, hey, what's going on with uh, data that comes off the network? And the, the, the answer there is, well, we just record the data that comes off the network so that when we replay, we just uh, deliver uh, that data that we recorded as if it arrived off the network, even though during replay, we're not actually communicating with anyone. Okay. So I'm sorry, I'm missing this. Sometimes there's dynamic. Sometimes there are flash of dynamic content that we record it. You have certain URLs, but the next time we do the browser was, it may give a different URL. You don't have that content. So you're describing an application that has non-deterministic behavior? Right. It won't. <laughs> so the the important thing is, do I need to press a button here? The imp look at that. The, the important thing is, uh, no, so they're, they're, uh, what we are going to do is ensure that the sequence of instructions that are executed during replay are identical to what they were the first time around. So it will have the same behavior. And we're going to force that to happen. If the application is using some kind of randomness, if it's using input, if it's looking at timer interrupts, those are going to happen in the same way during replay. So its behavior will be the same. That is the key point. If that doesn't happen, we, sh we have to quit and give up. Okay, let's let's push along. Uh, hold that hold that thought, uh, but let's not stall here too long. What I'd like you to do uh, f at this point, okay, once we pass this slide, let's accept that this replay mechanism works. Now let's talk about using it for uh, uh, debugging. So the uh, I, I want to point out that what I'm talking about here is uh, actually implemented in VMware Workstation version 6.5. Uh, it's available right now. The particular component within Workstation that does this stuff is, we're calling it the integrated virtual debugger. And what it is, is it's an extension to Visual Studio. It plugs into Visual Studio. Uh, it supports C and C++ replay debugging. And the feature is technically experimental at this point, which means if, if you find a bug, uh, try not to yell at us too much. Um, but it's, 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 uh, it's useful, and I hope you'll give it a try. We'd like, and, we're, and we're actively working on it to make it even better. The, the goals of, of, what, of the integrated virtual debugger is we want to preserve the Visual Studio debugging experience. So basically, when you, you sit down at this debugger, you know what to do. And we just want to leverage all of that existing knowledge about how things work. And then we add a few key, key features. Well, we add this deterministic replay. We allow you to debug something that's actually replaying. Uh, so it's having the behavior it had, not as it appears to be running, but as it did when it was recorded. We also add this, uh, a single sort of new feature called reverse continue. So when you hit the continue button, that executes until you encounter some sort of an event. You hit a breakpoint, uh, you encounter an exception, this sort of thing. Reverse continue is exactly the same thing. It logically executes backwards until you encounter the previous breakpoint or exception or some sort of interesting event. Uh, 
Okay, and then the final point is it provides some um, uh, support for managing VMs. So since we're uh, working inside a VM, since our application is running inside a VM, uh, it would be a bit of a pain if you had to start up the VM and start the program running and start the recording and then attach to it and so on. So this uh, integrated virtual debugger actually does the heavy lifting of managing the VMs, powering them on, starting the recordings, that sort of thing. So I, I guess I shouldn't call this a goal, but you should know it. There are a few key constraints that we've added here. Uh, and the, the most important one is we can't change registers and memory as we're debugging. And I think that, that hopefully sort of makes sense why that would be, because we're replaying the execution of the program. If you change the state of the program you're replaying, then presumably you're doing that to change the behavior of that program. And you can't do that because it's a recording. Uh, similarly, we can't change the control of the program. The control of the program is determined based on uh, what happened during the recording phase. So we can't just say, hey, go execute this function, because that function execution wasn't in the recording in the first place. OK. So uh, the big picture here in preparation for a little demo I'd like to do is, well, OK, we've got Visual Studio, and we like to sort of attach it to some process and debug it. OK, let's get a little more specific here. So we're sitting on some physical machine running Windows. Uh, and now let's put the final piece in play. What we're doing is we're, in addition to running Visual Studio on this Windows machine, we're also running Workstation. Uh, and VMware Workstation is giving us a virtual machine running Windows. And in that virtual machine, there's a process running. Uh, and what we logically want to do now is debug that process. So that, this is sort of the big picture. This is what we want to do. And the reason, of course, why this guy, this process is in a virtual machine is that we want to leverage the ability of the virtualization layer to record everything that's going on inside that virtual <coughs> machine. You with me? Yes, good. So uh, let's look at uh, a demo. So I've got an application. It's a stock trading server. And it links a bunch of clients, remote clients, to a single backend server. So it's just taking these, these trade requests uh, processing them in some way, doing some logging, and then uh, sending it to some backend that actually uh, executes the transaction. The problem with this application, though, is sometimes the application crashes at the end of the day. That seems like bad news. Crashing is not a good thing, uh, especially in uh, this kind of a context. The challenges with this bug is, well, it's non-deterministic. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's also particularly challenging to, to debug because the setup for this application is complex. Like for the developer to sit down and play with this thing, well, the developer has to set up a workload, which means spawning 150 clients. And then the developer has to get a uh, backend server, a de development only backend server, because he doesn't want to connect, of course, to the real backend server and actually execute trades. Uh, in addition, live debugging results in timed out clients. So you've got all these clients connected to you, right? And whenever you set a breakpoint and you think for four seconds about what to do, well, your clients end up timing out. Uh, so this, this application can, can be a bit of a pain. So, so let's uh, do a little debugging here. Let's give it a try. So here I am in Visual Studio. I've got this TradeStar 2 project. What I want to point out is uh, the uh, plugin that we have in, the, in uh, Visual Studio gives us this VMware menu. And uh, this VMware menu gives us a, a number of things to do, uh, a number of uh, additional facilities. I'm going to point out this options uh, option. Uh, and I just want to point out how we configure uh, replay debugging. We just have to uh, basically name the virtual machine we want to run here. And we name the recording we want to replay. And that's pretty much it. Uh, so now. Given that we've got a VM, we've got a recording. Let me try that again. Uh, what we can do is go up here to the VMware menu, and I want to say Start Replay Debugging. Okay, And what that is going to do is that's going to bring up VMware Workstation. It's going to restore the state of the machine uh, that, that represents the start of the recording. That's what we're doing right now. Then it's going to start replaying the program as it executes, and that's what we're seeing right here. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we're debugging. So the, the program, this uh, 
text window here uh, hasn't done anything very interesting. Oops. Let's, that's good. Right, good. Hasn't done anything very interesting yet because we're just at the first line of main. But I want to point out that uh, if, you, if you look at what I'm doing here, we can do sort of standard, your basic uh, windows, or no, your basic debugging stuff. I can step over some functions. I can say step into a function, you know, step some more. Uh, I can step out of a function, takes me back to where I am. If you look over on the right hand side, I've got all my local variables. If you look down here, I can see what DLLs I have. I can see what threads I have. I can look at my call stack. This, it feels like I'm debugging, right? There's nothing sort of special here. But the thing that's interesting is that I'm debugging a recording. So what that means then is it's, just go it's going to have the same behavior every time it runs. So if I set a breakpoint at this point, uh, then I want to continue. And let me go back to workstation. I'll see uh, an entry for the first transaction. So that first transaction was for a client named Smithers. It's always going to be for Smithers. That's just the way it is. I just happen to know. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me do another uh, step here. So I just did a continue. It went one more time through the processing loop. The next transaction was for Lewis. Uh, and if, if I can just sort of keep doing this, and uh, I, could, I could debug this program over and over again. It's going to be the same every time. But OK, let's actually fix the problem, though. Let me take out this breakpoint. And let me just run. And after a while, OK, we've got a, an un, a, a first chance exception. And the problem is an access live violation reading some memory location, 6C, 6, 69 something, OK. Uh, here's the line at which that happens. Let's look in this T log structure. OK, head, the head uh, field has the value 6C, 69 something, and we're dereferencing it. So, so here's the manifestation, of, here's the, uh, manifestation of the problem, which is we're dereferencing some garbage pointer, obviously. So we want to know how this pointer got bad. Uh, so a natural way to do this is to set a data breakpoint or a watch point. So let's see if I can figure out how to do that here. So I want to say new data breakpoint, and I want to do that on tlog.head. Okay. And normally this sort of wouldn't do us any good because we've gone past the source of the problem. But what I want to do at this point is execute backwards. I want to execute backwards so I can find out who put that garbage in the head field. You with me? Good. Uh, so there is, uh, yeah, I could hit this little backwards button right here, or I could go to the VMware menu and say uh, reverse continue. This is just the an uh, analogy. This is the, I'll put this over here. This is the, sorry. This is the analog of forward execution. What it's doing is it's taking, taking me to the last event, the last breakpoint, the last watch point, whatever. It's not taking me uh, to, the, to the first watch point or the second going forward. It's taking me to the last one. So this is going to take me to the bad guy, the, bad, the guy who corrupted this data in the first place. Uh, so some stuff is going on here. I can, uh, I'll go through sort of the, the details about what this is doing in a second, uh, uh, make that a minute. But the point is, we have arrived someplace. We've hit our breakpoint. Let's uh, figure out what's going on. So we're in some uh, library code. Let's look at the call stack to get back to our code to find how we got in that library. OK, we were calling stir copy, and we were copying the name Nahasapimapetalon into this last name buffer. And OK, I think there's our problem. The problem is our last name buffer only has uh, 12 bytes allocated to it, but Nahasapima Petalon is considerably longer. Uh, so the problem is we're doing a stir copy. We're not checking bounds. We're overflowing the buffer allocated for that string into an adjacent buffer, uh, into an adjacent structure, which contained this head field. And I could show you the declarations of these, uh, of these two structures, and you'll see they're right next to each other. It makes sense that one would overflow into another. So the summary there is, well, in fact, why don't I go to here. The, the summary here, then, is what this is giving us is mostly a normal debugging experience. I'm just using Visual Studio uh, and debugging. Uh, but bug reproduction is now trivial. 
uh, the program has become deterministic. It was not deterministic. Sometimes it would fail, sometimes it didn't. But with the, the recording, it's always failing. Another important point is the environment is part of the recording. So this was, an, uh, this was a program that's actually really difficult to set up and run at all, because you've got to set up all these clients uh, to, cert to give the workload to this application and the backend server. But uh, once you've got it in the recording, you don't have to do any of that stuff because the recording replays all of that network interaction, so it happens in exactly the same way. It makes de uh, debugging a whole lot easier. Uh, and in addition, reverse execution makes it easy to find interesting execution states because you can go, in addition to going forward, you can also go backwards if you've gone a little bit too far. So uh, at this point, I'd like to take some time and talk about, actually, are you with me? Any, anyone want to throw out any questions here? Yes. So what does it take to create this recording in the first place? Hey, okay. so, so the question is, what does it take to create this recording in the first place? And that's a great question, and I apologize that I didn't tell you. <laughs> so the, uh, there, there are basically two ways to create recordings. One is uh, if we go up into the, uh, well, let, let me do this. Let me uh, stop debugging. So if we go up to the VMware menu, there's this option, create recording for replay. And what that's going to do is that's going to power on a VM, res uh, restore to a particular state and time, start recording, start the execution of your program. So that's just going to create the recording for you. Uh, it's also the case that the VMware workstation itself has a recording button. So even if you don't have Visual Studio, even if, if, if it's the quality assurance engineer who doesn't want to play with a debugger, uh, they can still just press the record button and then give that recording to the developer who can then debug it. Yeah? There's actually a couple of use cases that you find incredibly valuable, and I'm not, not sure if they're addressed. So I'm just what is the ability to... If, if this is going to be long enough, should you use the microphone, maybe? Yes. Because uh, yeah, I'm going to... Could, could we have the uh, microphone? Better luck? There we go. Yeah. OK, so the, the, there's two big use cases we, we really care about, and they're, they're somewhat related. And basically what we want is a situation where we could have some sort of either an automation test running or um, a, a manual test running. And the way we do a lot of that right now is we have a bunch of VMA images laying around. Um, we, we pull one up, we have someone either run an automation test against it or they'll, they'll play with a particular feature or whatever, and then, oh darn, a crash happened. What we'd love to be able to do is start up that session and say, okay, start recording this stuff, and if something happens in that session in, say, the course of several hours of something going on, we'd love to be able to say, stop, record everything that happened in the last 10 seconds. Um, moreover, we'd love to have that be able to some, have something automatic where OK, we've got, say, 1,000 VMs running somewhere, doing a whole bunch of automation tests, running through a whole bunch of sequences and stuff. And oh, darn, one of them crashed. Detect the crash, immediately record the last 10 seconds, send it to, the, to a developer to investigate. Are those sort right. of the sorts of things you guys are thinking about? Oh, yes. So this is great. So these are great points. Uh, I, uh, there's, there are two answers to this question. If you go grab Workstation 6.5 right now, we've got nothing for you in that regard. But we're, we're playing with exactly the stuff you're talking about. Uh, and I think this is, this is sort of what I'm imagining. Uh, you want. And I think there's sort of two pieces to this. One, uh, let's see, so we can't, at the point of the crash, you can't, to decide, you can't decide to record the last 10 seconds because it's happened already. But what you can do is you can, we can just say record, but then trim off the old stuff. So that we can do, that, that uh, and the, yeah, it's, it's a black box situation. Uh, so that, that, uh, that we can do. Or, or will do soon, rather. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great case. That's a natural thing to want to do. The second part of this is sort of automating this. Because what you kind of want to do is, you know, if you've got a, you're running a bunch of tests uh, and you're sort of failing here and there, you don't want to keep trimming them off because you'll trim off those failures. So you want to have some in your scripts that are running. You want to have the ability to say, hey, stop this recording. Uh, save you know, the last uh, 10 minutes or whatever, put it aside, now start a new recording. Uh, I think that's great. I like it. Prashant and I were talking about that yesterday. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Uh, so, so let's talk a bit about the implementation 
here. Uh, let's get uh, a little uh, a little geeky. So. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Well, we have a replay infrastructure. Let's just accept that our replay infrastructure works. We can record what's going on in a VM, we can replay it. It's also the case that we have the ability to do remote debugging. And really, when you're debugging a program running inside a VM, it's, it, you're just remote debugging, right? Your, your uh, Visual Studio kind of just thinks it's debugging an application running inside another machine that just happens to be a virtual machine. Okay, and any debugger can do remote debugging, right? So it seems like replay debugging just is the combination of those two. It should just be easy, right? And what I'd like to do at this point is talk about why it's not quite that simple, and I want to talk about a couple of the challenges we, we have, and I think these are sort of the key challenges we have to making replay debugging work. So uh, the first is that uh, it turns out remote debugging is not really compatible with replay. It kind of doesn't make sense uh, so I'll talk about that in a second. It's also, I also want to talk about how we make reverse execution work. So you know that doesn't address the fact that we want to have this abstraction of work, reverse execution. And finally, uh, we want all this stuff to work with Visual Studio. And Visual Studio is not really playing our game. Visual Studio doesn't know about reverse execution. So we might have to, we might have to fool it a little bit to make, uh, to make all this work. So. Uh, Let's talk about the sort of incompatibility of replay debugging and remote debugging. So here's a normal remote debugging setup, right? I've got some physical machine. It's got some target process I want to debug. I've got Visual Studio. And what uh, I have running on that physical machine is some sort of debug monitor. In the Windows world, this is MSVC Mon. And that's the entity that's controlling the execution of that target program, reading its registers, uh, uh, setting breakpoints, those sorts of things. So that's sort of the normal remote debugging world. Uh, so in the virtual context, which is where we're operating, we've got this uh, uh, virtualization layer sitting underneath. And this is great because it's giving us the ability to record what's going on inside that uh, VM, but I think this is where you start to see the problem. Uh, remote and replay debugging are incompatible because remote debugging requires execution in the remote machine while you're debugging. Let me say that again, this time clearly, maybe. Uh, the point is, while we're debugging, we're going to say things like, hey, what are the values of the registers? And we want MSVC mon, or whatever our debug monitor is, to execute, to run some code to figure out what the values of the registers are. The problem, though, is MSV, MSVC Mon didn't do that while we were recording it, right? So what we want MSVC Mon to do is do a different thing when it was recording and when it was replaying, and that's at odds with what our record replay mechanism does. You with me on this problem? Yes? And if you did just the record button on the VMware workstation, then MSVC Mon wasn't doing the picture. Yeah. That's exactly right. So the, the statement there was, uh, the, the statement was, yeah, that's right. And uh, if, you are, if you press the record button on uh, the VMware Workstation UI, MS, MS, MSVC Mon wasn't even running at all. OK, so what's the solution to this? Well, the solution is we want to provide some sort of debug monitor functionality outside of the machine. Uh, and we're going to use the virtualization layer to inspect the process state and read register values and read memory and that sort of thing. So the picture then looks like this. Here uh, was the original circumstance. We've got this virtualization layer underneath. Uh, and what we want to do, really, is basically move the uh, debug monitor functionality into the virtualization layer. OK, so what that means then is we can replay everything that's going on in here, just like we always were. And Visual Studio is going to talk to this uh, debug monitor uh, that's running outside the VM. So it can do whatever it wants. And it can, of course, still ask for register values and set breakpoints and do all those sorts of things. Uh, the basic functionalities of this debug monitor, it needs to start and stop the program. It needs to read memory, set breakpoints, detect interesting events like a breakpoint has been encountered or an exception has been encountered, a DLL has been loaded, these sorts of things. Uh, and I think the, a, a key uh, result of all of this is this is an important part of non-interference, right? Because we're not running anything in this, the guest, that knows about debugging. All of the debugging functionality is, in fact, outside of the entity that you're trying to look into. So you with me on this? What do you think? Go
Good. So uh, let's look at a couple other challenges. Uh, one is just this, this whole feature of reverse execution. So we saw, we saw it in the demo. Uh, it took us to a point in, in the past. And the question is, how did that implementation, uh, how do we implement that? Uh, and my guess is, well, so let me tell you. Uh, the idea is we could, we could uh, try to actually undo instructions one at a time. But you only want to do that if you've got a lot of time, right? Because now we've got some sort of interpretation overhead per instruction. And if you do something like this, well, you're probably going to see a slowdown of, say, uh, say 30,000, eh, maybe 100,000. It's going to be slow. So what we want to do is instead leverage the fact that we've got this really uh, efficient and high fidelity way of reproducing the machine state at any point in time via replay. We're going to simulate reverse execution via replay. So the idea is, if this is our timeline, uh, we're, we're running along, the program started, we stopped right here. Maybe we hit a break point. And then we say, hey, I want to go backwards. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do two phases. First is the, is the discovery phase. And we're just going to execute along and, uh, and look at the events uh, that we're encountering. These are like breakpoints and these sorts of things. So the idea is we hit, say, a breakpoint. And then we, then we have to say to ourselves, well, are we there? Is that the last event of interest? Uh, well, you don't know because there might be another breakpoint right here, right? The only way you know uh, what the last event is is when you get to where you started, right? So we just keep executing along. We encounter these events. Here we created a thread. Uh, here we hit another uh, instance of the first breakpoint. Uh, and finally, at some point, we reach where we started in the first place. And only now do we know what the last event was. This was the last event. So now we know where we want to be. Now we have to get there. And of course, we do that in what I'm calling the final phase, which just takes us straight to that state in time. OK, so this is what we, if you think back to the demo, I don't, I don't know if you were, uh, if, if you didn't blink, you saw that we actually had these two replay steps. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. But I do want to say, are you with me? OK. Uh, I do want to say also that uh, a, a a key thing we need to do here is optimize, because we don't always want to do two, these two replay steps. And in fact, often we don't have to. Because if we want to do another reverse execution, well, we know exactly where to go. It's, it's here. So we can just go straight there without that discovery phase. So optimization is key to making this practical so we don't have to have all of those replay steps. It's also the case that. Uh, well, we want to, we don't always want to have to replay from the beginning of the program. So you can sort of drop checkpoints periodically and just go back to the previous checkpoint and replay from there. It's also the case that uh, DWAR, what does that mean? Uh, deliver events without replay. Uh, the idea is, well, this create thread event, for example, Visual Studio is just going to say, hey, thanks for telling me a thread has been created, continue. So from a user's perspective, replaying to that point in time to deliver the event is kind of a waste. So you, what, what we want to do is instead just deliver the event, but not actually replay there to avoid, uh, uh, to avoid a, a costly replay step. OK. What do you think? <laughs> Thumbs up. Excellent. Question. Yes? Well, what would happen if you tried to turn around the, kind of, you know, the transistors? So, so that's in, so, the, so. So, I, I'm going to have a hard time repeating that question. But the question was sort of something like, "What if I actually wanted to uh, sort of at the at the actual logic level turn the crank backwards? Turn the crank backwards. Actually, have the concept of reverse execution. And the, and uh, it's an interesting question. The thing that's particularly challenging about that is execution destroys data. So you actually overwrite data. So you can't derive your you can't always derive your inputs from your output. You need a stack. Right, so you would need to store some additional information. So I think so we'd have to go further than actually, you know, sending the electrons the other way. But it would be interesting. Uh, the I think the my feeling is that uh, that's going to end up storing a huge amount of data. And what this avoids is it avoids precisely that, because the because all we need to be able to do is replay. Okay, but let's talk. Uh, I thought you were I thought you were going toward this problem. Uh, so here's another challenge. And the challenge here is that Visual Studio is, is, uh, 
is not with us on the whole reverse execution thing. Visual Studio doesn't know about reverse execution. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to do, sort of deliver undo events so that reverse execution feels like forward execution. So suppose here is our timeline. Suppose we're, we're executing along, we encounter a load DLL, a create thread, then we exit that thread, then we stop at this point save because we hit a breakpoint. Now suppose we want to do reverse execution here. So we of course don't know where the destination is. The breakpoint could be here, it could be here, it could be here. But let's just assume we've got an oracle that, for this uh, demonstration that tells us the breakpoint is here. So ultimately, we want to get here. And the question is, what do we need to do to get to this point? Uh, uh, the, we could deliver, we could go backwards, deliver this, let's see. We could just go to this point in time, right? The problem though is, uh, the Visual Studio will think that the DLL we loaded at this point is still loaded. But at this point in time, it wasn't. You with me? So if, if we uh, revert to the state at, or at this point in time, and then the user chooses to look at their, uh, their modules, they'll see a DLL that's not, in fact, loaded. So we've got to sort of undo all of these guys so that Visual Studio has a consistent view of the world when we sort of wake up at this breakpoint. So what we're going to do is trick Visual Studio into thinking that it's playing forward. And then what we're going to do is deliver sort of the dual of this exit thread. We'll deliver a create thread. And the logic is we're, we're logically about to enter this region in time. And during this region, that thread existed. So we'd better create it. OK, so uh, here's kind of what's really happening. We're kind, we, here's what the user want, how the user wants to think about it. They're actually going backwards. They're going back to that point. Uh, OK, then we're going to, Visual Studio is going to continue to think it's executing forward. And we're going to deliver an exit thread corresponding to this create thread, because we're entering a region of time here where that thread didn't exist. So we better tell Visual Studio it exited. OK, and then similarly, the user's model looks something like this. We've actually gone back in time to this point. OK, then we continue on. We create an unload DLL corresponding to this load DLL. The user thinks of it this way. And then finally, we deliver this breakpoint. And then the important thing is from Visual Studio's, the debugger's point of view, uh, it has an accurate view about what threads exist and what DLLs are loaded at this point in time. But it got to that state, the state of the machine, by what it thought was forward execution. So we're just tricking Visual Studio, delivering these sort of pseudo undo events so that it has a consistent view of the machine when we, when we, when we take it back in time. Yes? Would you be able to uh, perfectly resolve information by doing that? Because you're actually performing additional operations to restore information. <laughs> so suppose if you're a loading a DLL in which Right. Uh, I'm not getting what you're saying. I'm saying you're actually introducing new operations, listening back to data. If uh, we're at that breakpoint, are we at still exactly the same breakpoint uh, as if we could see the first time? Uh, well, so uh, the, the important thing, the thing we're trying to achieve is when we stop at this point going backwards. The state of the machine, in terms of the, the, what the stack looks like, what the mo all the threads that are running, all of the DLLs that are loaded, the values of all the variables, is the same as it was at this point in time. So from the user's perspective, the state is identical between these two guys. That's the goal. Okay. I think what's going on is that uh, the debugger, the VMware, takes three additional operations to tell the Visual Studio to forget those happen so that the memory image loaded from VMware at that breakpoint is consistent with what Visual Studio is It's not actually three more functions that are being called. It's uh, three signals that are being So, 
so, so I, I, I will admit I'm confused. The, we are, in fact, delivering these events to the debugger. They're not happening. Yes, they're not actually happening. There, there is no create thread. Rather, there is an exit thread, and we want to logically move past it going backwards, so we just make up a create thread. And we make up a create thread solely for the purpose of compensating for the fact that we're, we're moving into a portion of the code where that thread exists. But this would be a great uh, thing to pick up uh, toward the end, just to make sure, because there's another talk in here at 3. Let me squeeze in a few more, uh, then we'll, we'll talk over here uh, in a second. Uh, so let me just give you a brief summary of the status of what we have right now, which you can play with right now. This, this uh, only works in Visual Studio in the Windows context, of course. We have uh, a super stealth uh, uh, replay debugging system that doesn't have reverse execution that works under Linux in GDB if you really want to give it a try. Uh, it works for C and C++. We only work with single processor VMs. Your host can have as many VMs as you want, but the VM itself can only have a single processor. The processor you're running on has to uh, work with the record replay technology. That basically it means it has to be kind of a new processor, uh, you know, core two, say. Uh, and when you uh, replay, you have to replay on a processor very similar than the processor, similar to the processor on which you recorded. Uh, and then the final point I want to make is we're not yet into the, we're, we're NYS, we're not yet into the slick regime. Our buttons aren't shiny at this point. Uh, but I think we've got something useful. Uh, there are a host of things that I think it would be fantastic to work on here. Let me just sort of point out uh, a few of them. You can tell me if uh, any of these would be helpful for you. Uh, one, right now we've got the separate recording step and then a debugging step. And there, there are contexts in which that's exactly what you want. But it would be kind of nice just to have this sort of all the time. You can just say, run my program in the debugger, and it just happens to be recording, and then you just happen to have the ability to execute backwards. So I'd like to have this implicit recording. So you can just debug, and it implicitly records and gives you uh, reverse execution if you want it. Uh, of course, uh, we always want to improve performance, particularly during reverse execution. Uh, it would also be useful to develop tools for isolating recordings from the VM. So right now, uh, it can be a little awkward manipulating a recording file itself because it kind of gets married to the VM itself. So if we had a way of, uh, we can build a simple tool just to extract the recording to make it easier to move around. Uh, it would also be great to have a sort of a concept of attach. Right now when you debug, you start from the beginning of the recording and replay. But often, you'd like to just sort of jump to the point where the, the bug happens. You'd just like to start right there. So you could sort of think of it as this is a glorified core file then, right? Uh, you, you go to the, the source of the problem, and then you look around. Maybe that's enough. Maybe you have to go backwards and figure out how you got there. And of course, some slickification. It would be nice to uh, integrate this with some existing VMware products. It would also be nice to generalize this for the Linux context, GDB, Eclipse, WinDBG, uh, all kinds of other contexts. So the, the pitch I'd like to make to you at this point is that I think we've got something pretty useful, but I, 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 I'm not convinced that we've got a complete solution yet. I think there are a bunch of things we need to do, uh, and uh, we need feedback from people giving this a try. Uh, so I'd love, love it if people could uh, give this a try. It's a 30-day uh, trials are free at VMware.com for Workstation, after all. Uh, so it's easy to try. Uh, but uh, we love feedback to help identify the most important use cases. How do people really want to use this thing to help us identify the features that are most useful uh, and to identify the context that are most useful? The people, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're doing all of your work in the Linux GDB context, the Visual Studio thing's hard to get excited about. Okay, so uh, let me skip right to the resources and say that uh, you know, here's where we can get Workstation. You can read about it at, at the blog at replaydebugging.com. Uh, there's a forum. Uh, and this is the most important thing. If you're at all interested in this, you want to give it a try, you want to talk about it, uh, you want to tell me what you'd like, feel free to contact eLewis, lewis at vmware.com. We can talk on the telephone. We can exchange some mail. My goal is to make this great. Uh, if this could be useful to anyone, uh, let's see. If we can make some changes to make it really useful for you, I'd love to do that. 
Uh, and if you're glutton for punishment, you can actually read the manual, but I wouldn't really recommend that. So in our remaining 21 seconds, maybe we could take one question uh, and then uh, you know, head over there and uh, do a little informal talking. The winner, yes. Yeah, so this, this is a great question. So the, the recording itself is deterministic, but the process of creating the recording, will that affect the performance of the system? And the answer is, uh, well, yes. And the reason why it's yes is, it, it, as I said, it, it, there's some performance implication here, right? We are executing some code. We are doing things different than they would have, than they would have happened otherwise. Uh, but I will say that uh, there's sort of two responses to that. Uh, one is, that uh, the impact we have on uh, the behavior of the program, I think, is comparable from moving from, say, one version of a processor to another. Like, that is to say, we're not introducing an overhead that's a factor of 10 or a factor of 20. That's just going to completely change the game. But this is the performance impact we have is like just do running on a slightly different processor. So it, it's still realistic. Uh, so it's still, you got what I'm saying? OK, we sh I, because it's 3 o'clock and we have to stop, I should stop. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to chat more with you afterwards.